Welcome to the Post Questionnaire. 35 questions giving us insight into what makes creative people tick. Uh, hi, Caroline. How are you? Hi, Uli. I am starstruck and excited because we are talking to a woman who is a friend of yours and whom I've never met but admired from afar, uh, Roseanne Cash. Roseanne Cash, of course, one of America's great singers and songwriters and musicians. She's been recognized with several Grammys, a nominated for Country Music Awards, um, is also the author of a memoir, Composed, which both of us read, which is a beautiful story of her growing up in California and, of course, um, the legacy of her father, Johnny Cash. And we invited her as the first guest because the idea of what we're trying to do here is to listen to people who are creative and also do good things in the world. So as you'll find out, Roseanne has been an activist um, for proper kind of legislation around guns in America for decades. She's a very committed person in this space. And the questionnaire is to give people a chance to talk a little bit more deeply about something that they care about uh, on a personal level without being a kind of sensationalist kind of reveal of their, you know, their private lives. That's right. And also without being just a platform for publicity about whatever book or album is coming out next. I mean, we always want to hear that information from our guests if they have it. But yeah, it's really meant to be a kind of a more timeless conversation about about who our guests are, about what they value. And I think that Roseanne Cash uh, is going to be enormously interesting for, for that reason. And, you know, I met Roseanne through friends. And the first time I met her, of course, I was also starstruck as one is. Um, I was also probably a bit clueless of who she is. I just, oh, this is Roseanne. And then I kind of had to piece it together because no one introduced her as Roseanne Cash. But what she said to me, she said, oh, I heard you've translated Rilke. And in my memory, I think on her phone, she had a Rilke quote as a screensaver on her phone. So she loves literature, loves poetry, and mm -hmm. has read an enormous amount of books and things. So that's why I wanted to talk to her, not because this questionnaire is about post, but because it's about people who use their mind to do good things. Yeah, yeah, no, and I, I, I think it is going to be so exciting just to find out what are the influences? What are the things that feed this uh, this creative mind? So it, it's thrilling that we have her. We want to also uh, point out to our listeners, of course, they can find out more about who we are. We both study literature and now teach. I teach at NYU, you teach at Columbia. Um, and they can find us on Instagram. The post questionnaire is post.questionnaire on Instagram. Uh, my own Instagram is Uli, it's U-L-I-N-Y-C at Instagram. I am on Twitter as Uli Bear. Roseanne is on Twitter as Roseanne Cash, and it's R-O-S-A-N-N-E. -N -N There's no E besides at the end in her name, not the other Roseanne. So it's Roseanne Cash, one word. That's her Twitter, which is um, also very political, engaged, entertaining, funny, and creative. And she's also on Instagram, uh, where we... Of course, also both presents, and her Instagram is MRSLEV, Mrs. Lev, because her husband is one of her collaborators, and that is her identity on Instagram. So it's MRSLEV. And tell us, Caroline, you can also be found on Instagram, of course. Sure. I'm on Instagram, and my handle is Caroline Weber 2020, all one word, and the 2020 are numbers and not written out. And yeah, let's talk to Roseanne Cash. I can't believe that we get to speak with her about this today. It's going to be so much fun. Great. Fantastic. Let's start. So we're so happy to have uh, Roseanne Cash today on the Proust Questionnaire. Roseanne, first of all, thank you for coming today. Oh, this is the probably going to be the most fun interview I've done in a long time. <laughs> Good. Yes. <laughs> so. Not, so, not to put any pressure on you. <laughs> well, we don't make up the questions, so there's That's not that much pressure, right? Yeah. Uh, all right. So to get started, we'll start to go in order and we may get sure. to all of the questions and we may not. This is a good one to start. What is your idea of perfect happiness? Um, you know, Caroline, I should first say that I know this questionnaire, so I've thought about this over the years, um, at least ruminated on it. I haven't come up with any hard and fast answers for some of them. But that question, I always think the perfect happiness is when my husband and my kids are all healthy and well, 
and happy and pursuing their goals and nobody is in crisis, right? Yeah. Yeah. Then I'm happy. My mother used to say, I'm only as happy as my least happy kid. And I always thought that was really codependent and an awful thing to say <laughs> mm-hmm. until I had kids. There you go. Yeah. yeah. So perfectly happy now. You're looking pretty happy today. <laughs> um, I'm pretty happy today. Yeah. We're knocking on wood and crossing yeah. our fingers yeah. and yeah. doing We're all sorts of superstitious right. things. I should <laughs> add something to that, though. I, I mean, I, I'm not happy unless I'm um, working. So if I'm also, if everybody's healthy and happy and I'm also working on a project I love, boom, that's it. Yeah, we, Uli and I have been talking about how much we love your memoir. And for me, one of the many, many great pages is where you talk about um, the sort of the satisfaction of work yeah. and how if you just are doing the work, that's its own kind of fulfillment. And that's, I think, something that many of the people we talk to can probably relate to and appreciate. But. Yeah, the work is redemptive. Yeah, yeah. All right, so conversely, uh, what is your greatest fear? Well, it's the flip side of <laughs> your first question is losing one of those people I love the most. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think that's a lot of people's greatest fear. Sure. sure. I also fear pain, physical pain. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess that's also fairly common, right? Um. Yeah, I would think so. <laughs> I share that fear. <laughs> uh, you know, I had a health crisis at, um, 12 years ago, and there was a lot of pain involved. And mm. so I'm always kind of, I have a little bit of PTSD about pain, you know. If, sure. it, if I get in any pain, I, I, I go down a rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah. No, you've had your share. Yeah. I've had my yeah. share. What is the trait you most deploy in yourself, Roseanne? Self-absorption. Okay. And what is the trait you most deplore in others? Bitterness. I can. I just can't bear being around people who are bitter because I, I don't – I know it seems like it could be a default position if you've had a really hard life or something horrible has happened, but it's not a default position. It's always a choice. And – I think bitterness gives you wrinkles, <laughs> so I I stay away from it. And you mean bitterness and carrying a grudge, or not? Not just not a, letting go, or not just a grudge, but blaming the universe, blaming others, mm. thinking that you have it harder than everyone else. That kind of attitude just is intolerable. Mm. Um, which living person do you most admire? That was one of the questions I thought about, and it was really hard to decide. I admire single moms in service industry, minimum wage jobs, a lot. And in my profession, I come across them a lot, hotel maids and um, waitresses and people on crew and staff. And it's always humbling because... Generally, they're very cheerful, and they serve you, and, you know, they um, are, have really hard lives, much harder than mine. So I admire those a lot, and I get those people a lot, and I, I think that after that, I admire um, Barack Obama a lot. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> and he, he grows better by comparison every day. Yeah. Right. <laughs> All right. So what is your greatest extravagance? Saying no, that is my greatest extravagance. Saying no to particularly to um, offers that come to me mm. that have a lot of money attached, and uh, but there's something I really don't want to do and would compromise me in some way yeah. or just be, uh, you know, an annoying event. Yeah. <laughs> and the older I get, the more willing I am to say no and give up money. Yeah. I love that answer. Me that's, too. That's actually, yeah, I'm going to think about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What's your current state of mind? Um, well, go back to one. It's pretty happy, mm-hmm. but I'm also uh, a little overwhelmed. I have one family member who's in crisis, and I'm worried about her. And um, I have a lot of work on my plate, and 
there's a legal obstacle in this project I'm doing. You know, so all of those things are kind of percolating. What do you consider the most overrated virtue? <laughs> Austerity. <laughs> All right. Oh, wow. Well, okay. I like that answer. <laughs> okay, that austerity is right out of the Catholic playbook. Right. right? And, yeah, and that doesn't even occur to me as a virtue. Your rejection of Catholicism, yeah. Um, okay, uh, on what occasion or occasions do you lie? Um... Usually to not hurt someone's feelings, but I would say that I sometimes embellish rather than lie. Um, mostly like to uh, give energy to a conversation or something. Yeah. <laughs> That's a really bad habit of mine. You make up stuff. <laughs> Keep it moving not, along. <laughs> not make up stuff, but like... Um, like, just make it stronger or more dramatic than it actually was. You're a writer. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you're, that's it. It's Thank a professional. you, Lily. Thank you. Actually, yeah. yeah, it's your job. To yeah. Do my, my kids roll their eyes at me. Um, all right. What do you most dislike about your appearance? Oh, um, every place that collagen used to be but oh. isn't anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's a good one. All right. <laughs> um, oh, which living person do you most despise? Ugh. There are a few candidates out there. There are a few in, candidates. In our there's, day and age. There's a few that are, who are vying for the number one spot, but I would say today Mitch McConnell. Mm -hmm. We've heard that a few times. So. Have you really? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. Well. So, okay, so he ranks really high up there of people who despise someone that is Mitch McConnell. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Profound oh. corruption. Um, so, again, inversely or conversely, what is the quality you most like in a man? Oh, um, most like. I really love a man who has the ability to listen and doesn't mansplain <laughs> or, just, <laughs> or just wait to inject his... Ooh, he has that in spades. You, you Capacity always, to listen. You're a very good listener. You know, I had to learn that. I was not brought up socialized or it wasn't intuitive to me. So That's so interesting. I learned that. But the fact that you were willing to learn it or knew it was something you should learn, yeah. that's yeah. a huge yeah. deal. I learned it from women, <laughs> for sure. Of course you did. <laughs> <laughs> what is the quality you most like in a woman? Um, kindness. Devotion to art, loyalty, which one of those would be first, so uh, probably kindness. You said kindness, devotion to art, and loyalty. Yeah. They're all uh, they're beautiful, actually, all of them. Uh, yeah, I, I think the umbrella for those would be uh, personal integrity, you know? Mm. Yeah. Just mm. an right. attention, uh, right. awareness. Right. Um, which words or phrases do you think you most overuse? <laughs> what time is sound check? <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that. I would, uh, we haven't least, heard that one. No, we haven't. At least it's not Mitch McConnell. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> or what time is lobby call? <laughs> you know, the, the time you have to meet the band in the lobby and, to go to either sound check or the airport. <laughs> <laughs> What or who, Roseanne, is the greatest love of your life? No, my husband. Mm. You know, I um, I had a dream about him before I met him, and I dreamed that it was the deepest love, and we were had reconnected after lifetimes of not being together or lifetimes of being together. I didn't know, and then I met him, and I said in my mind, I went. Oh, no, it's him. You knew right away. I knew it was him right away. Wow. Yeah. So then he and I had this argument for years about um, what love is. Is it instant or do you, does it develop over time? And I was all about it's instant, and he was all about it develops over time. <laughs> and then we met in the middle. 
Yeah. It's yeah. both. It's both. Yeah. And maybe it's both. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, and you've been married for how long now, too? Uh, 24 years. So, yeah, yeah, it's had time to develop over time. Yeah, yeah. that's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, when and where were you happiest? Well, I just have a baby grandson, oh, which right. has made me realize that I've always been happiness, happiest when there's a baby in the house, nice. whether... Mostly my own babies, mm-hmm. but now him and even other people's babies, if they were in the <laughs> house, it made me happy. Nice. <laughs> okay. Um, which talent would you most like to have? I would love to be a great pianist. I've thought of that so many times, to just sit down at the piano and have it come intuitively and naturally and with soul and with technique and through many genres, I would love that talent. Hmm. Right now I go, ga, 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 ga. Are you, teach, are you taking classes right now? No, I did. I, You know, at some point you have to say, what do I have time to focus on to become better at and what do I not have time? Mm-hmm. And that would be a lifetime pursuit. Mm-hmm. If you could change one thing about yourself, what would it be? Um... I would be free of painful ruminations and obsessions about the past. That's the thing that most troubles me and regrets. I don't trust people who say they don't have regrets. I think I have many regrets. And so would I change the obsessions or would I change what I actually did, what actually happened? Well... Right now, I I couldn't go in the past and change it. It's mostly to do with mothering. Really? You know, like, oh, I wish I'd done that for that kid. I wish that hadn't happened. I wish that trauma hadn't taken place. But, um, so yeah, I'd change the obsession about that. Those 4 a.m. alarm bells. (laughs) I saw one of your lists on Twitter. Oh, <laughs> well, the four ham obsession. <laughs> we'll put it in the we'll put it in the notes. It's pretty funny, actually. I liked it. <laughs> uh, what do you consider your greatest achievement? <clears throat> that was one that I've thought about, and I couldn't. Oh, you know what my greatest achievement is? Is surviving my childhood, and not just surviving it, but becoming um, f- flourishing having a passion, mm-hmm. devoted, devoting myself to it and becoming good at it and showing up for work and that persistence and resilience. That's, that's really my greatest achievement. Um, if you were to die and come back as a person or a thing, what <laughs> would it be? <laughs> Myself, but um, more evolved, <laughs> smarter with all the knowledge I have now and... More compassionate, less self-absorbed, you know, just more evolved. Nice. That's a good answer. Where would you most like to live? Well, I I think where you live is a choice and that it's not fair for me to say I wouldn't live in New York City where I actually live because I'm not handcuffed being here. At the same time, I'd love to live by an ocean where I could look at waves every day. Yeah, and that features um, a lot in your memoir, actually. Yeah. You talked about how important moments in your life you've spent looking at the, at this, at the ocean, right? Or taking the problem to the sea, you know? Yeah. I mean, I'm certainly not the first person to feel like that. I think Patti Smith wrote about that in yeah. her yeah. Mm. memoir as well. And um, there's something purifying about the ocean. So New York by the ocean. It may happen, actually, sooner than we think. <laughs> yeah, sadly. <laughs> right? And there we're all downtown, be, so the water be, is going to... Yeah. There may be New York by the ocean. Right? Sadly. That's so true. I should build a seawall outside right. oh, my God. house. That would become our most treasured possession. <laughs> uh, uh, what is your most treasured possession? Mm. Wow. That is something that's hard to answer. I... I guess my good memories, that has to be it. Yeah. Nothing better. Yeah. 
I love the bit that you wrote in your memoir, though, about the guitar that's going to come back oh, to you God. one day. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my, it's still in unclaimed baggage in Hawaii. Is that where it is? Yeah, <laughs> right. or in at, at LAX <laughs> on the curb somewhere. I guess the other thing too would be um, movies or videos of my kids hmm. as children. I would hate to lose those in a fire. Although I do tell people if <laughs> if my house burned down, the first thing I'd grab is my estrogen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> We're staying alive, okay? Priorities. Uh, Hence the the good memories that I hold that, on to, right? Right. right. I like that. No good memories without the <laughs> What do you regard as the lowest depth of misery? Oh, oh, do we even have to talk about it? Um, the lowest depth of misery is this toxic combination of grief and guilt. Mm -hmm. and fear for I mean I you know one of my kids has had such a hard time and the fear about her that kind of physical visceral reaction of fear and grief is just horrifying it's the worst it's the depth of misery mm. yeah. I was going to ask you but then we're adding something how do you get out of it but I'm not going to ask you that right now yeah. Uh, what is your favorite occupation? What would you want to do if you are... I think the question is meant to be if you weren't doing what you're doing right now or if maybe it is what you're doing right now. Yeah. You mean work-wise yeah. or leisure? I think How so. How you spend your time, yeah. I think. Yeah. So. My favorite occupation is songwriting, uh, particularly when I have that moment in writing a song where I see where it's going and how it should be finished. And I just have to do the legwork from that point to the finishing. That bit is so satisfying. Or when recording, you know, when a track suddenly comes together, like you know what the arrangement is or what to do next, and then it comes together. That's just, that's my favorite. Beyond that, I love sewing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you do really? I do. I don't right. love the actual sewing. It's that's really tedious. But I love sitting with my girlfriends and sewing. Yeah. You know, Uli, you've been I to do. a sewing circle. I've uh, visited for minutes. You visited. Oh. You've been the only male. I'm, I'm the very. I'm very gender specific. <laughs> it's it's a woman's sewing circle. I've stepped in and out <laughs> as a as a bystander, right? Um, what is your most marked characteristic? I just, I, I think I'm not objective enough to know that. Like, I would have to ask someone who stands outside me, who knows me well. But, I mean, from the inside, my most marked characteristic is my curiosity. What but I think it's, sorry, it's interesting. What do you think people see? Or maybe this question comes up later on. Like, yeah. what do people see when they see you, do you think? When you think from the inside, your curiosity is closest or most marked for you. What do you think people perceive when they meet you? Um, that I pay attention. What would, what would be the word for that? Yeah, attentiveness or yeah. Yeah. presence of mind. Yeah, being present. Yeah. Yeah. And we may have kind of implicitly covered this when we're talking about uh, favorite characteristics mm. of men and women, but what do you most value in your friends? Well, it's kind of selfish, but I value that they keep showing up for me. They keep coming to my concerts. They're interested in what I do. They um, care about my feelings. You know, I really value that. That's all selfish stuff, but it's attentiveness on kind of a deep yeah. level, too, right? Yeah, that's they're, right. They're paying attention. They're paying attention, that's right. Um, who are your favorite writers? Shakespeare. I have a bit of an obsession with Shakespeare. Um, let's see. I love Hilary Mantel. I love Jane Austen. I've read, you know, everything multiple times. George Eliot, love um, Rilke, mm -hmm. I love. <laughs> I know that. Yes. <laughs> I know that. Um, Mary Oliver, the poet. Um, Stephen Greenblatt, the um, Shakespeare sure. yes. yeah. scholar. Also James Shapiro. Mm -hmm. um, 
I'm trying. Oh, MFK Fisher. Oh, there. It, it's on. Um, She's a, on culinary on food. food. She was a food, food writer, writer. Uh, amazing food writer in California or something. Yes. It, yeah. But she wasn't. It wasn't a, like the food was the framework. Yeah. And she wrote about relationships and, um, you know, her inner life by writing about food. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. In fact, I kept her picture on a postcard above my desk when I was writing my memoir. Really? Yeah. I I do. I love her. Mm -hmm. And Alice Munro, short story writer. Yeah. Yeah, MFK Fisher, I haven't thought about in a while. That's right. It's very Californian to me somehow. Yeah. Well, she did live in California. Yeah, yeah. But she also lived in the south of France. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's it. Um, okay, that's a that's a lifelong list. That is a lifelong yeah. list. Yeah, and a nice preponderance of women writers, I have to say. That's yeah, heavy on the women writers, but uh, that's actually not intentional. It's yeah, just sure. the way it's gone. Um, that's one of my chief regrets too, is that I won't be able to read all the books I want to read in my life. Yeah. That's a hard one when they start to pile up. Oh and my time god! Is short. I know. I read somewhere, my husband sent me this article that I had missed in the FT, um, some scholar coming forward with seemingly convincing proof that Shakespeare might have been a woman. Did you see that? I mean, it didn't I sound right to me. But hate I hate that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I really do because, I mean, if you read Shapiro and Greenblatt, mm-hmm. they can trace back these references of in course. the plays that have to do with the flowers that grew nearby when he was growing up yeah. and, you know, the all of these connections. And I, I don't like the Oxfordians either who think the Earl of Oxford wrote yeah. the plays. Mm-hmm. I think that's really elitist. In fact, I got in a serious argument with a friend of mine about that, and I ended up calling him an elitist, and he blew up. <laughs> really? <laughs> While you're discussing whether the Earl of Oxford or Shakespeare is Shakespeare, <laughs> that in itself Already, is, is a bit... Already, you've maybe lost that war. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. just, and this is another musician, too. You just we called were, a spade we were, a spade. <laughs> we were backstage waiting to go on, and we cleared the dressing room very quickly really? in this fight. But why do you not like the idea that Shakespeare could have been a woman? Why did you respond to that right now? Because I... I think Shakespeare was Shakespeare. Mm-hmm. I think it was him. And mm-hmm. I think all of these theories about that he was someone else, that it, it, he didn't exist, that some of it's elitist and some of it is um, denying the history. Yeah. I think part of it is the the enigma of genius. Yes, that, that is that true. That one person could have conceived of so many people in his own mind, mm-hmm. that the the characters are so varied in the plays and plus the sonnets, but that someone can contain so much, I think allows everyone to say, this can't be a real person. So I think it generates actually this kind of investigative work. I I know exactly what you're talking about, and you could make the same case for Mozart or Beethoven, mm-hmm. you know, but, but people don't yeah. make the case for Mozart or Beethoven. And why wouldn't there be someone in history who was conferred this inexplicable genius this light, you know, this clarity of thought and poetry that never before or never since. I mean, it's possible, right? It's yeah. a mystery. Yeah. It's a mystery. It's, it's a mystery. mystery wrapped in an enigma. Yeah. To be that receptive, though, it's a, it would be amazing to be so attuned to language that it, that it <clears throat> goes well, through, passes through you and you can transform it. It's not true that he didn't borrow, though. He yeah. borrowed heavily. Sure. And even some of the... Other plays were co-written, you right. know, some of the less well, well-known well, yeah. plays. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But also just the idea that that power of imagination is so great. I mean, the, yeah. the thing I didn't love about this article about how maybe Shakespeare was a woman is the woman the, um, the scholar thought might have been Shakespeare was a from a Venetian Jewish immigrant family. And then much of the article was about, well, and that's what enabled Shakespeare to uh, imagine Shylock. And it just seems to me, mm. like, as you pointed out, Shakespeare had this vast capacity for imagining other worlds, other lives, other people. And it does feel like when you start to look for identity po- po- identity politics matches, like, well, he must have been Jewish to be able to understand Shylock. He must have well, been a woman. If that's true, then there were probably other 
displaced Jewish aristocrats who didn't write any plays. Sure. <laughs> so in some yeah, ways, it doesn't course. become a formula. Yeah. Well, yeah. that that and that theory too is like he couldn't have written about Venice or Parma because he wasn't in yeah. Venice or Parma. There was plenty of literature, and there were plenty of people he probably know who had been to these places, and he got descriptions from them. And also, if you look at the contemporary uh, writings about Shakespeare. Um, I mean, people refer to him. Yeah. They and there was jealousy, and <laughs> of course resentment. there was. Yeah, already yeah. back then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you know, having said all of that, one of my favorite movies is Anonymous, which is about the Earl of Oxford actually mm. writing Shakespeare. A great mm. movie. I, it's a mm. great, great movie. I must have watched it eight times. Yeah, seriously, and I'm not an Oxfordian, so there you go. Okay. I thought when you said anonymous, I thought that's the Romana Clay about Bill Clinton. Is that the <laughs> Joe Klein? Oh, no, 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 right. <laughs> Joe Klein. I was really, I was like, that wow, where is this going to go? Yeah. All right. okay. yeah, connect those dots. Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, which historical figure do you most identify with? I had a million answers for that question, and I couldn't settle on them. And this one of the one person I came up with was Ben Johnson, who was Shakespeare's contemporary mm -hmm. and wrote about him, and who was very good, but was completely eclipsed by Shakespeare. <laughs> so he's the Salieri of Shakespeare. Exactly, <laughs> the Salieri. Salieri of Shakespeare. <laughs> That's your historical figure. <laughs> okay, and can we can we venture to ask no. why? No. Okay, that is like a whole wow. That actually opens up a lot. Okay. It does open so a ben lot. Ben Johnson, and, okay. and you are not letting us walk through that door. No, don't walk through that door. Okay. But the other answer would be Marie Curie. Oh, because um, she was singularly devoted to what she did. And also there's a bit of a longing in that because I'm not nearly as devoted as I'm not willing to get radiation poisoning <laughs> by, right, you know, going right. into the studio. Yeah. And she was. Right. She was so devoted. Yeah. That's um, – okay, so I couldn't say I, – I, well, I do identify with her. I haven't achieved that kind of mm -hmm. singularity, mm -hmm. but I identify. Mm -hmm. yeah. To go back, one question. Who is your hero in fiction? Do you have a, a, a fictional character? Probably Elizabeth Bennet. Oh. Because yeah. um, she believed in love and was willing to hold out for it no matter the cost. She had um, personal dignity and a, a integrity in the face of living with a lot of crazy people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and... Um, she was fierce and kind at the same time. So she's my hero. That's wonderful. And then in real life, who are your heroes? Mm. That answer could be the same as um, the people I most admire, you know, the, mm. the single mom minimum wage workers who show up and are cheerful and have mm -hmm. a mission. And then people like, the Obamas who don't stoop to the level of vindictiveness to which they are victims. Mm -hmm. And then people like Ely Vassell <laughs> who take the most profound trauma and violence mm -hmm. to them, done to them and turn it into something healing. I guess those are my uh, real heroes. So it's what it makes me think it's the word dignity. Yeah, dignity and integrity. Sort of single mothers yeah. who are working hard, the Obama, so Elie Zell, sort of yeah. sort of personal integrity or dignity yeah, yeah. That's in the it. face of adversity. What are your favorite names? Well, the names of people, the people I love, my family, my kids, my husband. What is it that you most dislike? Mm. I have to think for a minute that I most dislike. Feeling helpless um, when something terrible is going on, that I can't change it. And on a much more prosaic level, <laughs> um, being handcuffed to have to be somewhere or do something I really don't want to do, you know, 
And on a third level, <laughs> staying in a hotel that I really hate. I mean, I stay in a lot of hotels. Sure. Um, and I kind of have hotel PTSD. Uh, mm-hmm. So if I have to stay in a hotel because there's nothing else there that's really awful, I just, oh, I can't bear it. But the second one you answered earlier, that your greatest extravagance is staying no. So maybe the second one, doing things you don't want to do. That balances each other out, right? So you learn to say no to things so you don't get stuck handcuffed yes, to exactly. obligations. obligations. Yeah. And maybe in bad hotels. Yeah. <laughs> are there particular, you, may, you probably don't want to name them here, maybe you do, but are there particular hotels you go out of your way to avoid? Like you won't go to a particular town anymore because you know there's just the one hotel and you, mm. you can't take it again? Or? Well, that depends. There are so many things to weigh. There's the economics. There's like I haven't been there in a long time, right. but my record is selling. I should go there, blah, 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 blah. This is the only hotel. I mean, I am not nearly as bad as some people I know. Who, if it gets below the level of a four seasons, oh, no. they won't go. <laughs> if it's the three seasons, they'll walk out. Yeah, okay. I'll go down as far as a Holiday Inn Express, okay. but no lower. All right, that seems that seems fair. fair. <laughs> that seems fair. That doesn't seem like a diva. That's not like you know, no. pluck out all of the brown M and M's in the candy jar in the green room. Um, I'm not a diva. All right, clearly not. Uh, what is your greatest regret? We touched on that earlier in another question, I yeah, think. Yeah, mistakes in parenting. Those are my greatest regrets. This one's morbid, but it's on the questionnaire. So um, how would you like to die? After saying goodbye to everyone. Um, I mean, I don't want to necessarily die in my sleep. I want to be able to say goodbye to everyone. Actually, you're the first person who doesn't say, I want to die in my sleep. I know. (laughs) You want to be actually awake and aware. I hear people say that, and I don't. I actually think you. hmm. Yeah, no, that you make a good case for it. Yeah, because there's too much. uh, There's even more trauma to the people you love and are leaving behind if that happens, right? Right. Wouldn't you think so? Because they never got to say goodbye. Never got to say goodbye. Right. That's an incredible gift to give the people that you're leaving if you're able to do it that way. Maybe it'll make up for how I fucked up in other ways. <laughs> Uh-oh, can you curse on your program? Uh, yeah. I think we can curse on our yeah. program. Not, I don't know. This is America. It's free yeah. speech, right? For now, we still have free speech, so... Yeah. Are we, we'll keep it that way. What is your? Do you have a motto? What is your motto? <laughs> well, I think I adopted the motto. You know, the Cash family was came from Scotland in the mid 1600s, and before that, it went. They went back in Scotland. We've traced them back to the 11th century. Mm. So somewhere along the way, because there were earls of Fife in my, the Cash family, there was a coat of arms developed for the Cash family. And the motto on it, which is really wild, is better times will come. Oh. So you always have that in front of you. No matter how bad it is right now, better times will come. No matter how good it is right now, better times will come. So I'm an eternal optimist. It's it's beautiful, but it also kind of makes me think of a kind of wind-torn castle in Scotland, and th- things are tough. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> better are better tough. times will come. Yeah. It's not that good right now. Well, right. that's it, a <laughs> particularly Celtic thing, right. isn't it? Sure. That's um, suffering, you know, and making it's, music out of it. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. no, one can see then the kind of connection to the American South. And yes, absolutely. Yeah. You said in your memoir that you, um, you had this... This idea, or early on, that you didn't, you wanted to live your life as a perpetual beginner. Mm. That seems to resonate with this idea that better times will come. That something new, that you wanted to be open to new things and not settle into a life that you'd already understood. Or I, I had never thought about that, Uli. But you're, I think you're absolutely right. Because if better, I eat different times are coming, then you are a beginner, right? That's always something to look forward to. I'm always excited about what's going to happen next. And I'm glad I've retained that quality. All right. All right. Well, better before, times will come. Better, better times, times will come. Will come. Although, so, hard to imagine having a better time than we just did. So, so well, Roseanne, we you. want to thank you really for um, oh. being on the Proust questionnaire. So, as you know, Proust found this um, 
little text, and I think in 1895, right? That's right, yeah. He was very young. He was 23, 24, and, um, and we're hoping to give it new life. Yeah. The, the questions give us a really interesting uh, set of glimpses into your creative mind, and we really appreciate you having taken the time yep. to do this. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.